Hello everybody and welcome to chapter number six in thermodynamics. Uh, this is Professor Algarra and this chapter is named as the second law of thermodynamics. So finally we reach chapter number six. We are very close to the end of the class. Um, as far as for this chapter goes, it'll explain a little bit what the second law of thermodynamic is um, and develop processes as they are and the statements of the second law. It's a very, very important chapter. And for the first time, we're going to start working with more than one component at a time, developing what the process are going to be. And basically, this is the ground information um, for next chapter, which is entropy. So we're very close to the end. Um, some Sometimes I'm going to evaluate the class up to this chapter in the exam, and then chapter seven will be optional. Um, I don't know yet how this one will go. Uh, but anyways, one of the most important chapters with more information, let's just start the chapter. So as we said, you know, more than one time in the previous chapter, energy is a conserved property and everybody knows that. Um, we have, we know that no process is known to have taken place in violation of the first law. Therefore, it is reasonable to conclude that a process have to satisfy the first law in order to occur. However, as we explained before, satisfying the first law alone does not ensure that the process will actually take place. So the first law pretty much will tell you the quantity, the quantity of the energy, okay? As you know, energy cannot be destroyed um, it only changed forms, it changed from one form to another. And we spent the last weeks just learning how to, you know, calculate the amount of energy that a system will have or, or a certain stage will have. And that's pretty much what we've been focusing on. The second law, it's pretty much what will tell you the direction of the process because some processes, they only occur in one way they go in one direction, and the second law is what determines the direction of this process. At the end of the day, the second law will also give you, um, you know, the quality of the substance. So you have the first law, which gives you the quantity, and the second law, which gives you the quality of the substance. So, like I said, the second law will tell you that there, will tell you the direction of the process. So if you have, for example, you know, um, you, the, this example right here, transferring heat to a wire will not generate electricity. So if you see like you have the current flowing from here to here or even from there to there, okay, depending on the direction, as the current flows through this uh, wire, you should have heat coming out of, you know, coming out of the system. If you transfer heat, you will not have you will not have current flowing through the wire. Therefore, the only direction of the process is the current flowing through the wire, and and as a result of that, you know Q has to go out of the system. If you have, for example, this guy, if you have a cup of coffee, you know does not get hotter in a colder room. So usually, if you have if you, if you have this process, and let's say, not with this example, let's say you have a spoon, right? And you start like rotating the spoon in the hot coffee, in the hot coffee. What would happen as you rotate the spoon to the system? The system is your hot coffee, the content of the hot coffee. If you start rotating the spoon, you know, in this direction or in the other direction, the heat will go out of the system. But let's say that now you add heat into your cup of coffee. Do you think the spoon will start rotating itself? That does not happen, okay? So the process cannot happen in that direction. And if you have this one right here, transferring heat to a paddle wheel will not cause it to rotate. If you have the paddle that starts like rotating, what's gonna happen with the heat? These molecules will start to dissipate and most likely the heat will go out. But if you have heat coming into your system, right, the paddle will not rotate because of that. So therefore, there is only one direction for some processes to occur. Major uses of the second law. 
The second law may be used to identify the direction of the process. The second law asserts that energy has quality as well as quantity. The first law is concerned with the quantity of energy and the transformation of energy from one form to another with no regard of its quality. The second law provides the necessary means to determine the quality of the substance. The second law of thermodynamics is also used to, determ to determine the theoretical limits for the performance of commonly used engineering systems such as heat engines and refrigerators. So just remember these two because we're going to start developing these two systems. So pretty much, um, you know, setting the limits, those systems will work between temperatures and the way we determine what the temperatures are going to be, it's by placing, but by studying the second law of the thermodynamics. But at the end of the day, one of the major uses is just to know the quality of the substance and also the direction of the process. So remember that because that's very important once we move into entropy. So before we get into the statements of the second law, we need to start defining some terms uh, in order to fully understand what's coming. Pretty much what we did in the first chapter. Remember, first chapter, just information, what thermodynamics are, what the, I'm sorry, what thermodynamic is, and then temperatures and pressure, and then we moved into uh, what the first law was. So now we're gonna be the, we're gonna be doing the same thing. So thermal energy reservoirs. It's very much a body with a relatively uh, large thermal energy capacity that can supply or absorb finite amounts of heat without undergoing any change in temperature. And that is called the thermal reservoir or just a reservoir. In practice, large bodies such as you know, water, oceans, lakes, uh, rivers, um, as well as the atmospheric air can be modeled accurately as thermal reservoirs uh, thermal energy reservoirs because of their large thermal energy storage capabilities or thermal masses. So if you think about it, right, um, think about a regular AC that you put into your window. If you see like the side that faces the inside of the house is cold air, but if you go outside your house and you put your hand in the back of the AC, you will feel heat coming out of the house and then going into the, atm the atmosphere. So pretty much the atmosphere is so large that the amount of energy that is going out of the, out of the, the AC will not affect the atmosphere. So that's why the atmosphere will call as an energy reservoir. You know, you are just throwing all the heat, all, all the wasted heat into the atmosphere and no problem with that. So the same thing will happen when you have substances that are going, for example, um, you have a power plant and then you will have uh, probably to refrigerate some components for that you will need water so when you have the hot water you will throw that to the ocean and and by throwing that to the ocean and going for sure through heat through water treatment um so it will not affect the atmosphere you will feel that the ocean will not change the temperatures because the temperature because of that so a reservoir that supplies energy in the form of heat is called, I'm sorry, is called source, okay? And the one that absorbs energy in the form of heat is called sink. So just think about it. So there are, there are energy reservoirs that will give energy to your system if you take a look at this one right here. So you have the source that is giving heat to your system. That could be Okay, I'm not going to give any, any examples, but it's just providing heat. And when you have a system that is, re, that is rejecting heat and that heat is going somewhere, that is called the thermal energy sink. So thermal energy reservoirs are often referred to as heat reservoirs since they supply or absorb energy in the form of heat. Okay? Heat engines. So before I move into the heat engines, one more thing that I need to uh, tell you. So from the thermal energy source or thermal energy sink, the temperatures and limits of the process will be determined, okay? So I need you to actually read this off the book as much as you can because this is quite important. It's super simple to understand. It's just a, re a source and a sink, but it's quite important when you go to the exercises because you're gonna have heat that is rejected to a sink and you're going to have heat that is needed from a source. 
So that's why it's very, very important. All right, so heat engines. The device that convert heat to work. They receive heat from a high temperature source, you know, such as solar energy, oil furnace, or nuclear uh, reactor. Second, they convert, they convert part of the heat to work, usually in the form of a rotating shaft. And then finally, they reject the remaining waste heat to a low temperature sinks, such as the atmosphere, rivers, etc. And they operate in a cycle. So last chapter, we were talking about a cycle. So a cycle is super simple. So you have one, two, three, and four. So the process will go from one to two, from two to three, from three to four, and then from four, it goes back to one. So that will complete a whole cycle, right? And they will go one, two, three, four, one, one, two, three, four, one, one, two, three, four, one, and they can do it, you know, as many times as needed. So like I pretty much like I told you, so works can always be converted to heat directly and completely, but the reverse is not true. Okay, so heat engines, like the example I gave you at the beginning, let me just go back. Okay, so if you have uh, this guy, uh, or let's take a look at this example one more time. So you have the transferring heat to a wire will not generate electricity. Essentially, that's what happened. But if you add another system, another system that will make this happen, then that will be called the heat engines. Okay. They receive heat from a high temperature source. They convert part of that heat into work. And basically they reject the remaining to a waste to a total energy. If, and if we couldn't understand, you can have it right here. So this is what is called the heat engine. They receive Q from a high temperature source. They receive it from here. Okay. Part of that Q that was needed, it's pretty much wasted to this to the uh to the low temperature source and they will produce an amount of work okay they take heat and they convert that heat into work okay they take the heat and they convert part of that heat to the work and then the remaining will go to waste to the low temperature sink and that is it that's what we call the heat engine heat engines and other cycle devices Heat engines and other cycle, uh, cyclic devices usually involve a fluid to and from which heat is transferred while undergoing a cycle. That fluid is work, it's called the working fluid, okay? And remember that term because um, if you have several components, or, or I think you had it in the previous one, so you had, um, you know, an engineering device and the device was receiving something here and going out of here and then you have we had that in the previous chapter so you have the substance what that was going through this device and then going out of the device that substance then will go to another device so the substance that goes through here and then goes to the next engineering device that's what we call working fluid all right If you take a look at a regular steam power plant, uh, we have a boiler right here. We have a pump, a condenser, and a turbine. So just I just wanted to remind you that we define each one of these components in chapter number five. And if you didn't review the video, I recommend you to go and do it because that's the base information in order to understand what we're studying right now. So this is the schematic of a steam power plant. So we have a boiler, we have a turbine, we have a condenser, and we have a pump. So what happened with the pumps, for example? The pumps, they will need work in order, you know, they will need some power in order to work. The boiler, the only thing that involves is the change in heat. So a boiler is just a heat exchanger. That's what it is. So it takes something that is, let's say, low temperature, and then some Q is coming from the energy source, and at the exit, you're going to have something with very high temperature that is ready to go through the turbine. As it goes through the turbine, some work is produced and then the remaining will go from here to the condenser. Why? Because you need the condenser to decrease the temperature so that it will be ready to the pump. And then it'll go like this for as many times as is needed. 
So if we take a look at this side of the presentation, okay, it has important information. So Q in will be very much the amount of heat supplied to the steam in boiler from a high temperature source, furnace in this case. Uh, Q out is the amount of heat rejected from the steam in condenser to a low temperature sink, such as, you know, the atmosphere or a river, etc. The workout is the amount of work delivered by the steam as it expands in the turbine and the working is the amount of work required to compress the water to boiler pressure. All this is attached to the definitions of each one of those components, you know, what is the essence of a turbine? What is the essence of a pump? Like, like I told you, you have to know that the pump will require electricity or power and then the turbine will produce that electricity. So they work in, in an opposite way per se. So if you want to know exactly what was the net amount of work that was, you know, given or delivered by the system, you have pretty much take the work out, which is what was produced minus the work that was necessary in order to be produced. You can also do that with heat. So the amount, the net amount of work, it's pretty much the amount of heat that was provided to the boiler minus the amount of heat that was rejected by the condenser. You can do it with either one of them. And that will bring me to thermal efficiency. So if you want to know how efficient a machine or a thermal or a heat engine will We'll be doing pretty much how one to recall when we study um, regular efficiencies back in chapter number three. We were studying mechanical efficiency, we were studying all that. So if you take a look at the definition now of the thermal efficiency, it's pretty much the net work output over the total heat input. And why is that important? Okay, I'm just going to go back to this. Let me just okay, for a little bit perfect all right so if we take a look at this picture one more time the essence of a of a heat engine you have q that is given to your system the system is right here all the little machines that you saw in the in the fall in the previous picture are right here they're just not shown you have some Q that is coming into your system the heat engine is a process okay four components turbine pump whatever four components you need to supply that amount of heat so you can produce this amount of work because probably that work will be used for something else but you need to produce that amount of work then by producing that amount of work some of that Q in has to be wasted. So think about it. Like you have, um, let's put it like this. You need to make an apple pie. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a simple, and I think it sounds like silly, but it's just a good example. Let's say you have an apple pie. In order to make an apple pie, right, to deliver the apple pie to your customers, you might need, um, I don't know, let's call it six different apples, okay? But it turns out that some apples were just damaged and you had to waste the apples. So now you don't need six apples, you need seven, but you need seven because you're gonna take only six good apples into your apple pie and then the, the one apple will be wasted because they were not, that was not good. So if you, if you have to take the efficiency of the apples, pretty much you have to think about the amount of apples that you need to make a pie versus the amount of apples that you needed to buy to make the pie. And that will give you some dollars amount and that's how you, you know, you determine the efficiency of that particular process. If we take a look at this one, going back to thermodynamics, you bought some QN, you got some QN, okay, some energy that you needed the process that you need to supply into your heat engine so your heat engine will produce this amount of work if you pretty much wanted to produce 200 kilojoules and you know that your heat engine is producing um, a waste of 100 kilojoules 
how many kilojoules you will need to be supplied to your system. That's the kind of analysis that you need to make. And that's pretty much attached with efficiency of the process. If I take just a quick look back to the thermal efficiency, it's the basically the amount of work that you produce versus the amount of energy that you had to put into. Or if you take a look at this, it's a net amount of work, net out over Q in. And you, and you knew before that the net amount of work was work out minus work in. Okay, you can see it here. Or Q in minus Q out. Okay, the amount of heat that was given to the system minus the amount of heat that was rejected by the system because the system, you know, it's not perfect and that will give you a number and that number is your it's a value that you need to put into the equation in order to get the thermal efficiency efficiency there is another way if i plug this guy into this guy you will get pretty much this equation it's one minus q out over q in the fraction of the heat input that is converted to network output it is a measure of the performance of the heat engine and it's called thermal efficiency. Okay? So, like I told you before, when you were calculating mechanical efficiency, so if you have a machine that is supposed to produce something, right? It's, it's supposed, you bought the machine because the machine was producing, uh, was supposed to produce 300 kilojoules, but in reality, it produces 200 kilojoules that tells you that the machine is not 100% efficient. It has probably an efficiency of, I don't know, probably 80% um, of that. So I have a quick example when I was doing my internship. So I used to do my internship in uh, beer companies such as, you know, like Samuel Adams, but back in my country. And I remember uh, somebody I, I was just walking through the machine room and I saw like huge compressors but they were they were not being used they were just turned off and they looked like brand new and I asked the engineer back then what are those and then he told me oh no those are compressors each piece cost like I don't know it was like 500,000 or something like that and then I said why are you using and then he said to me that the buyer um, he was required to buy some compressors uh, high efficiency compressors in Germany for um, so can be used to the process. So the buyer went to Germany and they bought the compressors. So they bought the compressors, they delivered the compressors from Germany to Venezuela. But all of a sudden, when they put the compressors to work, the compressors were not, were, they were not compressing what they supposed, they supposed to compress. Then they called back Germany and they said, hey, you know, this is not working as you say it was working. And then they asked, okay, you know, how high is the temperature of the room where the compressors are being held? So the temperature was a lot higher than in Germany. And they said, yeah, that's right. That's why. Because in Germany, we have some environment and you have a different environment in Venezuela. And that's why the compressors are, are not performing in the right way. So we're talking about like $2 million of equipment. So they had to do, I mean, they were studying if it was worthy to make a room only for the compressors and then put some AC or something like that in order to reach that temperature. But that's kind of what a thermal efficiency or any efficiency will look like. You have something that's supposed to do one work, but in reality it delivers a work differently. So the difference or the relation between them both will give you a number which is up to 100%, and that 100% or whatever number that is will be the efficiency of the equipment. And that definition will take me to, hold on one second. All right. Before I say anything, there is something important, yeah. QH, and QL. Let's read this. So QH is the magnitude of heat transfer between the cyclic device and the high temperature medium at temperature TH. QL is the magnitude of heat transfer between the cyclic device and the low temperature medium at temperature TL. The net amount of work could be calculated as QH minus, minus QL 
and therefore if I take the net amount of work into the equation one more time I could have a different equation which is this one right here so you had before 1 minus q out and q in now I'm gonna forget about q out and q and q in and I'm gonna call that ql and qh and why is that important because from now on all the exercises are gonna be referred as h and l which is high and low if you want to think of if you want to think it this way so high from the high temperature source and low from the low temperature source so that's exactly what it is so if you have the heat engine finally and we can define a heat engine which is this it's a composed of one two three four or five of different components the heat engine supposed to deliver some work okay out but in order to deliver that work net out you need to get some energy coming from a high temperature source so now we're going to call qh and ql instead of q in and q out okay so you can forget about it and now you have only qh and ql and ql okay going back to this and those two definitions remember qh will have TH attach and QL we have TL attach. Remember that Q is heat and T is temperature. We use Q for the first law calculations, but then we use T to define states. Remember, that's a property. And just remember that. That's quite important. Okay, and that will bring us to the statement. There are two statements for the second law of thermodynamics. So let's just read it. It is impossible for any device that operates on a cycle to receive heat from a single reservoir and produce a net amount of work. Moving on, it says, no heat engine can have a thermal efficiency of 100%. Pretty much, there's no perfect machine. You will always have losses. And that's what we account for as engineers. Okay, uh, losses due to friction, due to expansion, things like that. We're always going to have losses and there's no perfect machine. So if I go back to this, I really like when I'm deleting everything. If I go back to this and I just want to have a clear drawing of the schematic, Okay, so if I go back to this, there's no way that you will take all the QH and it'll be produced as a, as a work net because that will be at 100% efficiency and that's simply impossible to happen. That's not a real process. So the statement says that, let's just read it again. It is impossible for any device that operates on a cycle to receive heat from a single reservoir and produce all of that energy into work you will always have losses you will always have ql that is rejected to the atmosphere as the result of the working fluid flowing and sorry flowing through each one of these devices that's what i what it says and it's very important so let's just read it again it is impossible for any device that operates on a cycle to receive heat from a single reservoir and produce all of that into work. You will always have QL coming out of your system. Remember that. Okay? And this is very important. Now, there's no heat engine that can have a thermal efficiency of 100%. And always remember that because this is very important. All right. So that was the first statement of the second law. In order to define, so the first statement was the first one, okay? Heat engines are pretty much very old engineering systems that they used to work in the past. And now, um, you know, another statement was developed with fresher information, with more things that, it's, that are very important to define. So we're going now to study refrigerators and heat pumps. Okay, we were talking about heat engines and with the heat engines, we developed the first statement of the second law. So now we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna take refrigerators and heat pumps and develop the second statement. So the transfer of heat from a low temperature medium to a high temperature one requires a special devices called refrigerators. 
Refrigerators like heat engines are cyclic, cyclic devices. The working fluid for use in the refrigeration cycle is called refrigerant. Okay, remember that. So pretty much um, what we have in the refrigerator is a transfer of heat from a low temperature medium to a high temperature and that requires a refrigerator. So take a look at this system right here at the picture. All these pictures are quite important. So you are taking Q into your evaporator and you have a working fluid that is going into this direction. It goes through the expansion valve. After that, it goes through the compressor. The compressor needs power. I'm sorry. Oh. The compressor need po needs power in order to work and then after that it goes through the condenser and the condenser is rejecting some Q. Okay, so let's just read it again. The transfer of heat from a low temperature medium to a high temperature one requires special devices called refrigerators. Okay, so if you, let's say, well the old ones, I don't think these ones will have it. If you have a refrigerator for example, um, a regular one at home and you have uh, that refrigerator that has um, like a heat exchanger in the back. So if you put your hand in the back of the refrigerator, you will feel hot air or, or you will feel like a hot temperature. That hot temperature is this guy right here. Let's, let's think about another example. The unit that you, the AC unit that you put in your window, right? So you have air cold air coming into your window, but then if you go to the back of the unit, you will feel hot temperatures on the outside. And that's a result of the Q coming out of, you know, the, the coming out of the AC unit. Okay, because remember what you do, you remove heat from the space that you want to be refrigerated. And that's why the temperature usually, the temperature drops because you're removing heat. Okay, so we defined the heat engine and the, the heat engine was related to a thermal efficiency. So now we just define the refrigerators and the, refrigera the refrigerators will take us into something that is called coefficient of performance. It sounds like efficiency pretty much. The efficiency of a refrigerator is expressed in terms of the coefficient of performance or COP. The objective of a, of, of a refrigerator is to remove heat from a refrigerator space. So how do you calculate pretty much, you know, the coefficient of performance? So you have the amount of heat that needs to be removed over the amount of work that needs to be supplied to the system in order to work. Take a look at this picture again. You have your system. And in order for this system to work, you need to put some work into that system. So, like I said, some QL is removed from the refrigerator space. And that Q, it's going into this cycle, receives some work, and then delivers some QH to the waste. If you want to know how efficient or how is the performance of that machine, then you will have the amount of work that you need to basically get in order to remove the heat from that refrigerator space. So coefficient of performance is another efficiency as we were studying. And if you take a look at the definition, it's the same thing. I always tell you the same thing. If you remember this equation, you can calculate any efficiency. Right now we're talking about thermodynamics, when, when, but when you get into machine design, you will have to calculate performance of those machines and then it'll be the same thing. It's a desired output over the required input. Okay, and that's from physics and you should you should just remember that. It's the same equation as we will as we were calculating before. Sorry. Again, so the net amount of work coming out will be equals to QH minus QL. And if I take this, you know, definition of work net and I put it into this one, then I will get that coefficient of performance is equals to QL over QH 
minus QL. And if I just simplify the equation a little bit more, I will get something like this. Remember that equation because you need it when working with refrigerators. Heat pumps. So heat pumps, pretty much, they will work in the opposite way as we work with the refrigerators. So if you wanna think about it, you have the AC and you have your heating system. Same thing, refrigerators and heat pumps. You need to calculate the coefficient of performance, okay? And you have the desired output and the required input. Like I said, the heat engine, the heat, the heat pumps, sorry, will work pretty much in the opposite as the refrigerators. Like I said, you have your AC unit and you have your heating system at home. Just think about it always when it comes to this uh, analogy. That's what I'm trying to bring. So it's a desired output versus the required input. So what do you need to the heat pump? You need to bring some heat in order to increase your temperature, right? And that heat, in order for that heat to be delivered, you need some work into your system. That's how you calculate the efficiency of that one. So it's a desired output over the required input. So in order, let's say a hidden system, in order to reach 70 Celsius when outside I have, I don't know, zero Fahrenheit, I'm sorry, 70 Fahrenheit, and then I have outside zero Fahrenheit, and then I need to pretty much amount of heat into my room in order to feel warmer, then in order to deliver that amount of heat, which is called QH, I need some power that has to be, you know, put into the system in order to deliver that. So if you take a look at the picture again, that's the required out input and this is the desired output. So that's what I need from a heating system. But in order to get that amount of energy, I need to put some energy in. And that's the difference between heat pumps and heat in, in, in refrigerators. So in the refrigerators, the coefficient of performance was QL over you know the net amount of work, but now it's gonna be QH over the net amount of work. Okay, the only thing that will change will be QH. And that will bring us to the cautious statement. So the first one, the one that we defined before, was the Kelvin Planck statement. So now we go to the to the to the other statement, which is a closure statement. It is impossible to construct a device that operates in a cycles and produce no effect other than the transfer of heat from a lower temperature body to a higher temperature body. It states that a refrigerator cannot operate unless it com its compressors its its compressor is driven by an external power source such as an electric motor. This way, the net effects on the surroundings involve the consumption of some energy in the form of work in addition to the transfer of the heat from a colder body to a warmer one. Okay? I know that thermodynamic definitions, they will not click at first, but once we read it again, it makes more sense, all right? So it is impossible to construct a device that operates in a cycle and produce no effect other than the transfer of heat from a lower temperature body to a higher temperature body. It states that a refrigerator cannot operate unless its compressor is driven by an, by an external power source, such as an electric motor. So if we take a look at the previous picture that we were talking about, pretty much there's no way that the machine will work without, let me just read it again, without some external source. So. What do we have in here? Pretty much we have QL that comes into a system and the system then delivers QH. There's no way you will have QL that goes through a system and then delivers QH without some external energy. And we're gonna work this at work net right now. That's what it says, there's no way. So the first one told you that there's no way that you will get some energy from a source and produce all that energy to work without wasting any heat. 
the second one, the second statement will tell you that there's no way that you will go from QL to QH without any external, any external source of work. Okay, when you take a look at the heat pumps or refrigerators, you need energy in order for the compressor to work. Okay, we take a look at this picture right here. So we need working in order to have the compressor working uh, through the cycle one, two, three, many times as needed. All right, so that was a cautious statement. And now we're gonna get into deeper waters. Okay, all that definition about, all those definitions about heat pumps and refrigerators and heat engines, all of them, okay, it's just an introduction as for processes as they are, you know, combination of different uh, engineering devices that will form a cycle, that will form uh, engineering systems, okay? You're gonna see that in the industry, you're gonna see that wherever you go to work, okay? And then there's important things that we need to define. And guys, what we're gonna talk right now, it's pretty much the base to entropy. So I will try to explain this in the best possible way. So we're going to define reversible and irreversible processes. Okay, reversible process is a process that can be reversed without leaving any trace on the surroundings. A reversible process is a process that is not reversible. <laughs> so it's, it's funny, that definition. All the processes of course occurring in nature are irreversible. So then why are we, are we interested in reversible processes. Number one, they're easy to analyze. Number two, they serve as idealized models or theoretical limits to which actual processes can be compared. Some processes are more irreversible than others. So there is always a confusion with this. People think that reversible process is a process that can work in the opposite direction. No, you have to delete that if you have that thought by now, you need to delete that of your mind. A reversible process is just a perfect process, a process that is perfect, that is ideal, that doesn't exist. Why doesn't exist? We had before the two statements of the, the Kelvin-Planck statement and the Clausius statement, and they, those statements told us that there's no perfect machine you will always have waste and you will always will require and you will always require some external work in order to you know to assist them to work therefore reversible process are just ideal process that they don't exist a reversible process are the process that we have in nature the process that usually of course all the processes are going to be irreversible because there's no perfect process and again, why are we interested in the reversible process? There has to be always a model that we can compare to. So ideally, so when you're in thermodynamics, this is just an introduction of the terms and everything is perfect. There's no losses. We don't count for anything. We're looking for um, equilibrium all the time. And that's not true in nature because you will have different temperatures. And if you go deeper and deeper and deeper, you will have more specific cases but we need to have the ideal processes in order to understand what's coming so uh, ideally you could have um, a, a car that will last forever but in reality it's not okay but then if you understand the way it works then then after you understand the way it works when it has no problems then you can see you can compare that um, working process of that car Whereas when you get a failure in the car, so you will see that something is not right. You know what I mean? So ideally your car should work in one way and all of a sudden doesn't work that way. That means that something is broken and then you need to replace it. So some processes are gonna be more irreversible than others. So some processes will be uh, more perfect than others, okay? But just as it is right now, do not engage reversible process processes with direction or anything like that. Reversible process only means that they're perfect, okay? Ideal process. They're imp important because they're easy to analyze and they serve 
as just example or process that can be compared. Some processes, and remember these, are more irreversible than others. The factors that cause a process to be irreversible are, reversible are called irreversibilities. Probably I'm not pronouncing this right, but anyways. The factors that cause a process to be irreversible are called irreversibilities. They include frictions, uh, friction, unstrained expansion, mixing of two fluids, heat transfer across a finite temperature difference, electric resistance, inelastic deformation of solids, and chemical reactions, and the, and the list goes on and on. Okay, the presence of any of these effects renders uh, a process irreversible. So, if you have, uh, you know, the piston, okay, that is raising or is going down, it is expanding. But we never study the friction that will be between the piston and the cylinder because we were always studying ideal processes, like there's no friction. When you have friction, your process will be less perfect because now you have to account for the losses of energy that you have due to friction. Therefore, if you, have a pro if you had a process that ideally was producing some amount of energy, now it will not be like that because friction has been taken into consideration and that will decrease or increase your energy. Okay? So, the friction is the best way to see it. When you're expanding or mixing two gases, the same thing it will, will have chemically speaking. So, the factors that will cause your process to not be perfect, they're called irreversibilities. And you're going to hear that from now on because their reversibilities are directly connected to the entropy. So, moving on. Before we move into anything, there's, there's some things that need to be defined and, and that is called the Carnot cycle. And the Carnot cycle is pretty much a process that can serve as, you know, as an example to compare or, or a comparison to other uh, processes. So, as we mentioned earlier, you know, heat engines are cycled by cyclic devices and the working fluid um, of a heat engine returns to initial states at the end of each cycle. So, as we, as we take this one into consideration, we're going to study each one of the states of the Carnot cycle in order to understand um, entropy in a better way, okay? So, hold on one second, all right? So, there are four states in the execution of the Carnot cycle, and we're going to start explaining each one of them. We have the first one right here, then we have this one right here, then we have, um, so from one to two to two to three, from three to four, and finally it goes back to the initial state. So uh, we have something like one, two, three, and four, and it goes like this. And that's a cycle, right? It goes back to its initial condition the name of each one of them. So the first one is called reversible isothermal expansion. That's the first one. Then we have the second one, which is reversible adiabatic expansion. Then the third one, it's reversible isothermal compression. And then the fourth one, it's a reversible adiabatic compression. So let me try to explain this in the easiest possible way. Okay, and I'm gonna go one by one. So the first one, as we have it, is pretty much the reversible isothermal expansion. So initially, which is state one, the temperature of the gas is TH, okay? The temperature of the gas is TH. And the cylinder head, it is close in close contact with a source at temperature TH, okay? So they have the same temperature. As the gas expands, the temperature of the gas tends to decrease. But as soon as the temperature drops by, you know, by very, very, very um, amount of dt, you know, very small, it's just, it's just the temperature drops very, very slowly. Some heat is transferred from the reservoir into the gas, raising the, the gas temperature to th. So the gas temperature is kept constant as the, uh, at th. Since the temperature difference between the gas and the reservoir never exceeds the differential amount of dt, this is a reversible 
uh, heat transfer process. So, listen to me, there's a lot of um, blah blah involved with this. So, we have the first one. We have a cylinder with a piston. Do you have an energy source that has the same temperature as you have inside? And we're going to call that source QH. And QH has a temperature which is equals to H. It's the same temperature that we have inside. We call the first one reversible isothermal expansion. So when it's isothermal, that means that the temperature has to be constant throughout the whole process. So you're expanding your piston and throughout the whole process, the temperature has to be constant. So we're gonna move from here, probably here, expanding from one to two. You can see it right here. As you expand this very, very, very slowly, TH has to be constant. What happens? If you expand your gas, the temperature will tend to decrease. You have now more room and, and your things are, and, and your molecules are just moving and the temperature will try to decrease. But then you have the cylinder exposed to QH. As it tries to decrease, QH will give more heat into the substance, so TH will kept constant. That's what it says. So from one to two, from one to two, it will be expanding and always TH will be kept constant. Okay, that's what happened. It's just an isothermal expansion. It's an expansion that will keep the temperature constant due to the fact that the piston is exposed to QH. And now we move to the second process. The second process will be a reversible adiabatic expansion. So at state number two, the reservoir that was in contact with the cylinder head is removed and replaced with an isolation. So now you're just, you're removing the cylinder from that high temperature uh, source and then you're putting some um, isolation into the, into the piston head. So the system becomes adiabatic. What is adiabatic? Remember guys, from previous classes. So adiabatic from, pre from previous classes. Adiabatic means that there's no transfer of heat whatsoever, okay? So the gas continues to expand slowly, doing work on the surroundings until the temperature now will drop, okay? The piston is assumed to be frictionless and the process to be quasi-equilibrium uh, so the process is reversible as well as is adiabatic. So now let's focus on the second one. The piston head, so we're moving from here to here. The piston head, now it's removed from QH and you will put isolation. So now there's no transfer of, key, of Q at all. So if you keep moving the piston from this position to this one, as you move this very, very, very slowly, and now you don't have any Q coming in, the temperature will drop. And that temperature will drop to TL, which is a low temperature source. So that's why it's called adiabatic expansion, because you're ex you're, you keep to expand your piston in an adiabatic way. And because it's adiabatic, the temperature will drop. And that will take us into the third one, which is this one. So this is one, it's already defined. This is two, now we're in three. The third one is isothermal compression. So what happened in an isothermal compression? So this is called state number three. The, iso the uh, insulation uh, at the cylinder head is removed. Okay, now we remove the insulation. And the cylinder is brought into contact with a sink at a temperature TL. Now the piston is pushed inward, okay? Now we're pushing, we're compressing by an external force doing work on the gas. As the gas is compressed, its temperature tends to rise. But as soon as it rises by very, 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 very small amount of dt, you know, it's very small amount of differential of temperature, heat is transferred from the gas to the sink, causing the gas temperature to drop. Okay, in that way, the temperature will remain constant. So in the second one, we reach TL. 
What happens when you compress something? When you're compressing in a piston and cylinder, as we study in chapter number one, two, three, and four, as you compress the cylinder, the temperature should try to be to rise. You know, the temperature should should go up. That's what should happen. But you're going very, very, very slowly. And as much as you try, as you try TL to go up, now the cylinder head is in contact is in contact with an energy sink. So now the temperature will not drop. Now the Q will be removed from here and go into the energy sink so you can have the TL at a constant temperature. That's why it's, it's, it's isothermal. So TL from this process number three can be kept constant through the compression. So that's why it's called isothermal compression. And that's number three. So now we go to number four. Number four, it's called reversible adiabatic compression. So what happened in this one? So this is now called state number four. It is such that when the low temperature reservoir is removed, the isolation is put back on the cylinder head and the gas is compressed to uh, in a reversible matter. So what is reversible again? Perfect process, no friction, no anything. So the gas returns to the initial position or initial state, state number one, remember that. Now the temperature will rise from TL to TH. And why is that? Because now you have insulation and the insulation is not causing any Q uh, to leave from the system. Therefore, the temperature will increase. So let's take a look at the picture again. So if we have this guy, right, now you're compressing even more, but in this case you have insulation. And because you have insulation, Q cannot go out because it's, it's just adiabatic. And therefore TL will go back to TH. And that's why it's called adiabatic compression. Just take a look at this. It, it went from here to state number one, from four in one to one. All right? So if we take a look, uh, you know, pretty much the Carnot cycle, and this is the one that we are just worried. So we go from one to two in an isothermal matter, and then from from two to three. Now we move to a different temperature, moving from TH to TL, and then we move back isothermically into four, and from four we move to one. By doing that, you're getting QH, absorbing QH, and then sending. QL to the atmosphere or anything. So I have something here that I want you to pay attention to. It says a reverse Carnot cycle. I want you to explain the reverse Carnot cycle and I will do that as extra credit. Okay? But I'm gonna do it differently now. I'm going to post in the discussion uh, board uh, a question related to the Carnot cycle and I want you to find a video that will explain the reverse Carnot cycle and then you will post that into the discussion board. If you do that, you will get extra credit and that's, uh, I mean it, okay? And that extra credit will serve for your first exam or second exam or probably you can use it for homework. I don't know if you've missed any homework assignments but let's see what it is, okay? I also want you to uh, tell me in that discussion board, and that will the question that will that will be posted is pretty much why it's important to know about the Carnot cycle. I will give you more guidance uh, once we move into pretty much into the once I post everything into Blackboard. I will give you more guidance uh, related with that. So the Carnot principles, and pretty much I'm I'm just you know defining this with you. So the efficiency of a, a reversible heat engine is always less than the efficiency of a reversible one operating between two, between operating between the same two reservoirs. Two, the efficiency of all reversible heat engines operating between the same two reversibles, res, reservoirs are the same. Sorry uh, for my pronunciation, but anyways. So again, let's just read it again. This is always my advice more than one time. So the first one, the efficiency of a, a reversible heat engine is always less than efficiency of a reversible one operating between the same reservoirs. So take a look at this picture right here. 
okay you have high temperature reservoir and you have low temperature reservoir you have the reversible heat engine okay number three you have the two reversal another reversible heat engine and you have the reversible one so the first statement is pretty much that okay the the thermal efficiency of the reversible will be always less than the reversible one and that makes sense why because the reversible process are perfect process and the i reversible are the process that we have in nature so there's no perfect machine as the first statement of the second law says that means that your efficiency will never be 100. The efficiency of a reversible process is just perfect. Okay? The efficiency of all reversible heat engines operating between the same two reservoirs are the same. So the efficiency for reversible process, whatever those are, okay, any two reversible cycles, if they are operating between the same temperatures, if they're operating between the same temperatures, they will have the same thermal efficiency. So I just gave you a huge hint for the extra credit I'm offering to you. You can take it or not, okay? I will give you more guidance once I post everything on Blackboard, but I'm just saying that you should take advantage of, you know, of any of these things. So with that, we conclude chapter number six. It's been a pleasure. Um, we're very close to the end of the class. Um, I'm gonna post the homework assignment um, you know, which is going to be due in one week. And the homework assignment will be a little hard because it has more than one engineering device, but I'm pretty sure you're ready for that. It's not going to be a lot of exercises. Uh, they're going to be simpler. The chapter number six is super simple. It, it's a simple and easy chapter to read. It's only definitions and definitions and definitions. And the only equations that you need to remember are the ones related with efficiency. Okay. In chapter number six, pretty much compiles the information that we got from chapter number four and now we're putting everything together and we are assembled the puzzle. Something very important um, up to this chapter will be the exam. Chapter number seven will be an informative chapter. I'm going to define the equations. I'm going to send you uh, a homework assignment with it, but it will not be included in the, in the exam that we have uh, in the coming weeks. So guys, that was it for today. I hope you like it. Remember that you have to read the book, go through my resume content in order, to, in order for you to make sense of everything that I'm saying on the presentation. Uh, this is just a small explanation from my end and I hope you enjoy the class. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.